continuation of our lecture on taxation, we want to look at another aspect, another part of that subject. Uh, we are going to look at assessment, objection, and appeal procedures. Assessment, objection, and appeal procedures. Haven't gone through uh, introduction to tax or taxation. Haven't taken you through tax administration where we talked about the various bodies and uh, um, authorities that are responsible for administering taxation, assessing and collecting tax. We now want to look at how are uh, this assessment done. And where assessments are done, what is the duty of a taxpayer? What is his position as regards um, assessment? Okay? So that's where we are today. And um, we start from there. Let's start with assessments. Let's start with assessments. Um, Company Income Tax Act 1990 has um, given the board, the board here, Joint Tax Board, Federal Board of Inland Revenue, the authority, the power to assess every company chargeable with tax after such company might have complied with rendering of return. Okay? So, it therefore means every company after rendering return will be assessed for tax. Now, after that, the next step is that the taxpayer will be served a notice of assessment. What did I say? A notice of assessment. The assessment has been done. The, uh, the board has done the assessment. You now have to serve a notice of assessment to the taxpayer. Let him know what he is supposed to pay. That's where we are. The notice of assessment will state some items, will have the content, what it's, it's supposed to carry, what is this notice of assessment supposed to carry. If you have to send a notice of assessment to somebody, say Mr. A, what is he expecting to see in the notice of assessment? Here we are. He will see in there the amount of total profit the tax payable, because it's based on the total profit that the tax has been assessed, and um, that will be the tax payable. And where is the payment to be made? The tax station, the payment will be made to. Okay? Next, the content of an assessment. Okay? There's a notice of assessment. It's been sent to the taxpayer. So what will the notice of assessment contain? Don't forget here we are looking at um, what the notice will state. The amount, the total profit, the tax payable, and the place to be paid. Now, the assessment will include the following. A typical assessment will include the following. Okay. An assessment is, is, is a statement of tax payable. It's a statement of uh, tax payable and will carry some items. Will have content. Will contain the following. The tax file number of the taxpayer should be indicated there. The name and address of the taxpayer, relevant tax year, relevant tax year, that's a year of assessment, it could be 2010, 2011, or 2013. The nature of the taxpayer's business was stated in the assessment, okay? Of course, the address of the office from which the assessment has been raised, the station, the date and signature of responsible official, the turnover, the accessible profit, the capital allowance claim, if any, we will talk about capital allowance when we get to that uh, part of the um, syllabus, 
Loss relief is also somewhere there. We'll look at loss relief. Tax p- taxable profits and then the tax payable. These are what a typical assessment should include. This makes an assessment, a typical assessment valid, a valid assessment. All right? We move on. Move on to types of assessment. Types of assessment. Here we are going to spend some time going through all of this. What it means is an assessment is raised. It will depend on the type of assessment that is raised. And the type of assessment will also depend on the situation. Okay? Depends on the situation. Let's let's look at it together. What, what we mean by uh, situation. Original assessments. Original assessments. What do we mean when we talk about original assessment? Original assessment. Um, you see, original assessment is the first assessment raised on a taxpayer in a particular year of assessment. The first assessment. That's why it's called original. The first assessment that the tax authority will raise on the taxpayer. So I'll prefer referring to these as first assessment. First assessment. Okay. That is raised on a taxpayer in a year of assessment. It may be the subject, the original assessment may be a subject of objection. Subject of objection. That, what, what that means is that the assessment could be objected to by the taxpayer. By the taxpayer. And if that happens, it will go through the objection and appeal procedure that we are going to discuss very soon. Let's look at the next one, revised assessment. The revised assessment. What is the revised assessment all about? This is an assessment that is raised to replace an original assessment. An assessment that is raised to replace an original assessment. I'll call this one a replacement. I'll put here replacement so that you all remember. Replacement. So it replaces this. It replaces the original assessment. It replaces this. And... Um, why why will it replace the original assessment? What's wrong with the original assessment that the replacement should come in? This replacement usually arises from either a notice of ad- objection or appeal that is successful. Here, yeah, with the original assessment, I told you it could be subjected to a, a, a objection and it go through the appeal procedure. Now, if the objection and appeal is successful... Okay, there will be need to have a revised assessment. That is to say, the taxpayer objected to the original assessment, went through the pro- uh, uh, procedure, and it was found to be wrong. That is, he was correct to have objected. The original assessment will be revised. The tax authority will look at the case and revise the original assessment. So it becomes a replacement that nullifies the original assessment there. Um, Additional assessments. Additional assessment. Additional assessment. Um, additional assessment is usually raised from a back duty assessment. Back duty assessment. That's a, 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 a key word there. We we'll talk. We we'll need to talk about back duty assessment. What's back duty? What is back duty? Um, back duty. This has to do with. Um, Examining the books of the taxpayer to find out whether they have been defaulting in tax uh, payment. The tax authority can do that, can do that going back six years before the year of examination. All right? Six years before the year of examination. So that is back duty. An examination carried out on the taxpayer to find out whether they've been default in tax payment six years behind. Six years behind. So we are talking about um, additional assessment that brought us to the issue of um, back duty. Okay. So we we'll go on. We we'll move on to the next pa- um, provisional. 
assessment, provisional assessment. What's provisional assessment? This is a traditional assessment because it's a traditional assessment because it is chiefly an estimate of the taxpayer or an estimate of tax payable based on the tax paid by the taxpayer in the previous year. What's the meaning of this? What it's what we're saying here is look, the papers are not ready, your return is not there, and based on what you paid last year, the previous year, the tax authority will assess you on a provisional basis, on a provisional basis. So it's on a provisional basis, uh, okay, pending when everything is okay. So it is an estimate, okay, it is an estimate, it's an estimated thing, right? It could also be a subject, it could also be subject to, of um, objection and appeal. It could also be subject to objection or subject of objection and uh, appeal. Now, best of judgment, best of judgment, best of judgment. This will arise where the taxpayer as either not file return or is not even registered for tax purpose. Okay? So, what are we looking at here? Here, the taxpayer is not registered. Okay? No registration. No registration. Right? No registration. No return. So, where there is no registration, as a taxpayer or the taxpayer have not even filed return the best of judgment assessment is raised so where it happens the best of the inspector of tax judgment to estimate the accessible profit capital allowance claimable is done it is also referred to as BOJ. The popular name is BOJ, Best of Judgment Assessment, BOJ. Self-assessment. Let's look at self-assessment. Self-assessment. This was introduced in 1993. 1993. Um, and it, it requires a taxpayer displaying some level of trust. Okay? Because he is expected to complete a standard assessment form, a standard assessment form, standard assessment form where he puts, he fills in all required information, standard assessment form, and um, to encourage taxpayers, to encourage taxpayers, the standard assessment scheme will give one percent bonus one percent bonus this is deductible from the sixth installment what that means is that if you go through or if you go with the self-assessment scheme you have that um, benefit of making your making this tax payment over six installments over six installments. That's you can make the payment in six months. And then for the last installment, you the last installment, one percent will be deducted. So you have a bonus of one percent for payment. So of note, uh should put here one percent uh bonus, one percent bonus from sixth installment from the sixth installment sixth installment okay take note one percent bonus from the sixth installment protective assessment let's look at protective assessment protective assessment protective assessment protective assessment this will be raised on the ground of exp expediency 
expediency on the ground of expediency so this assessment comes up on the ground of expediency where it becomes necessary very very necessary All right if the tax authorities is is of the opinion that such assessment is necessary what could result into expediency urgency okay where a case is referred to the board and there's no ruling on that case we could use the protective assessment or protective assessment could be raised where there is imminent sale imminent sale so imminent sale or transfer of a trade or business to another this could also result or this could also lead to a protective assessment being raised okay where there is imminent escape by a taxpayer to a foreign country the tax authority sees a taxpayer as being able to move to a foreign country by so doing escaping from is tax responsibility protective assessment could be raised this protective assessment as the name applies is to protect the tax authority from fraudulent acts of tax payer good day students we are going to proceed into um, the next uh, stage or the next part of um, the syllabus as regards taxation by trying to look at tax administration we want to look at tax administration at this at this point tax administration what is tax administration all about what do we understand by tax administration at this point we are trying to look at the practical those that are involved with the practical interpretation and application of the tax laws remember in our first lectures we said the nigerian tax system is divided into three there are three components we talked of the tax policies we talked of um, tax laws and then tax administration now and i promised going into tax administration in details so here we are okay practical uh, interpretation and application of the tax laws who does that who's responsible who is responsible in the Nigerian tax system, there are established bodies, established bodies that are responsible for administration of the Nigerian tax system. Which bodies are we looking at? Which authorities? What are their compositions and what are their functions? Let's try to look at the first one here, the Federal Board of Inland Revenue. Federal Board of Inland Revenue. The board was first established under Section 3 of the Income Tax Administration of Ordinance of 1958, long time ago. But we still need to make reference to this date so that we know where we're coming from. And has since been subjected to a series of amendments. In fact, the latest one is CETA 1990. Okay, CETA, CETA 1990. She will be talking of CETA 1990 here. Um, uh, whole, uh, yes, CETA 1990. Okay, um, so let's look at um, another aspect of um, the Federal Board of Inland Revenue by looking at the constitution or composition of the board. The constitution or the composition of the board. Who and who makes up the board? Who and who makes up the Federal Board of Inland Revenue? The FBIR is made up of 10 members as follows the 10 members are the director of federal inland revenue department he is the chairman of the board four deputy directors of the inland revenue the most senior officer acting as legal advisor or assistant legal advisor in the inland revenue who is also on duty in lagos the principal assistant secretary with the Federal Minister of Finance, who is in charge of revenue matters. A representative of the NMPC, Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation. 
is also a member. A representative of the Department of Custom and Excise is also a member. The Registrar of Companies is also a member. So, those are the members of the FBIRO. Now, to their powers and duties. Okay, powers and duties. What are the powers and duties of the Federal Board of Inland Revenue according to Company Income Tax Act? The board is responsible, the board is responsible for administering, administering Company Income Tax Act. So it is the board that administers Company Income Tax Act. Accordingly, it must do all such things necessary for the assessment and collection of Company Income Tax Act. Of interest will be um, the, the lecture on um, the Federal Inland Revenue Service Establishment Act of 2007, which I have included in this um, um, topic at the later part of the lecture. So when we get there, we'll talk more about the Federal Board of Inland Revenue Service, which is a new um, board, a new service established by the government through the Act of uh, 2007, Establishment Act of 2007. Okay? Um, the board has the following duties, powers and duties, powers and duties in detail now. They have the following duties. One, it can sue and be sued in its official name. It may acquire, hold, and sell all of any property taken, right, taken as security for or in satisfaction of any penalty tax or judgment debt due from a company. The board must account for any such property or proceeds to the Minister of Finance. It may authorize any person authorize any person within or outside Nigeria to perform or exercise any of its powers or duties. It can not delegate those duties stated under Schedule 1 to the Act. The person may also receive any notice or document to be served upon, delivered, or given to the board. So what we are saying here is that the board uh, has the power um, to authorize any, board, any person whether inside the country or outside the country, to carry out its power. That is where they, they can be there physically. They can authorize somebody to carry out, they can commission somebody to carry out their function for on their behalf. Is that okay? Um, number four here, we are looking at, if the minister consents, the board may appoint the joint tax board to perform or exercise any of its powers, duties or functions. The Joint Tax Board is another board, another uh, tax administration body that we will be looking at in due course. Let's move on. Let's move on. We also have the Federal Inland Revenue Department um, and it is the executive arm of the board. It is the executive arm of the board. It is responsible for carrying out the decision of the board it is in charge of assessing and collecting company income tax. Do you get that? So, in the Federal Board of Inland uh, Revenue, there is a department, the Federal Inland Revenue Department, that does this function we have just enumerated. What is the structure, organizational structure of that department? It is organized into district offices. So, each district office is headed by an assistant director. So, that's the organizational structure to, for efficiency. They need, they, they had to bring it down to offices. The assistant director of tax is responsible for the assessment and collection of taxes from companies in his district. So, every zone, every district, what we call zone has an office that is responsible for the collection of tax from companies around that district or around that zone. 
generally each district officer this district office i mean is made up of the following department so when you come down to a zone or a district office we have this units again the administrative department the section the ad assessment section and the collection section jtb the joint tax board the board referred to as the board the Joint Tax Board was established under Section 27 of the Income Tax Management Act of 1961. As far back as 1961, that was the origin of the Joint Tax Board. But over the years, over the years, this act have been amended. Act have been amended. The Joint Tax Board is charged with the responsibility for the administration of Income Tax Management Act. This is what I ITMA means. As amended, as amended. That's why we have the uh, income Man income tax management act. It's made up of company income tax 1990 and uh, personal income tax act of 2011. Okay. The Joint Tax Board is made up of the following. These are the composition. These are the constitution of the Joint Tax Board. One. The executive chairman of the Federal Inland Revenue Service as chairman, a representative from each state of the Federation. And what are their functions? What are their functions? We have them here. The Joint Tax Board, JTB, is charged with the following functions. One, to advise the federal government, to advise the federal government in respect of double taxation arrangement rate of capital allowances and other tax matters including proposed amendment to the personal income tax decree now changed to act so it is the joint tax board that advise government on double taxation arrangement where we enter where we go into double taxation agreement with any country it is the joint tax board that is always in the forefront to see that everything is done in um prescribed and um, manner that will not be disadvantage to us okay they also promote uniformity both in the application of the personal income tax act this should be changed to act pita and in this incident of tax on individuals throughout the country so what it means here is that if there is a difference between um the tax laws in the states and the tax laws the federal tax laws it is the joint tax board that will make sure that there is uniformity or bring them together and one have one uniform tax law impose its decision on matters of procedures and interpretation of the personal income tax act on any states for the purpose of conforming with a great procedure and interpretation these are the functions of joint tax board let's look at the technical committee of the federal board of inland revenue the Fed technical committee composition who makes up this committee see all these committees are supposed to promote efficiency in the administration of tax in the country they assist this board to promote efficiency executive chairman as chairman composition all directors and heads of department of the federal inland revenue service they are all members the legal advisor to the board and the board secretaries these are the members of the um, technical committee of the Federal Board of Inland Revenue. Their functions. What are their functions? One, they consider all matters, consider all matters that require professional and technical expertise and make recommendation to the board. Okay? They advise the board on its powers and duties. They attend to such other matters that may from time to time be referred to it. Those are their functions. Let us now move to the state um, level because before now we have been talking about the federal level. 
That's why we're hearing Federal Board of Inland Revenue, Technical Committee of Federal Board of Inland Revenue, and what have you. For the State Board of Intern Internal Revenue, that's at the state level, the composition, the composition are here. It is made up of the executive chairman of the state service who shall be a person experienced in tax appointed by the state governor from within the state service. That is to say, he must be somebody in the state service that will be appointed to be the executive chairman of this uh, board. Next, the directors and heads of department within the state service the director from the State Ministry of Finance, three persons nominated by the Commissioner of Finance in the states on their personal merit, a legal advisor to the State Service, the Secretary to the State Service, who shall be an ex officio member. This is the composition of the State Board of Internal, Internal Revenue, and um, we move forward to look at their powers and functions. What are the powers and functions of this board at the state level? Here we are. One, the state's board is responsible for the assessment and collection of pay as you earn and other personal income tax. Yes, it is at the state level that pay, your pay, pay as you earn, that's the deduction made from employee salary is paid to at the state level. So that is it. So two, two. Ensuring the effectiveness and optimum collection of all taxes and penalties due to government. Doing all things necessary. Doing all things as may be deemed necessary. And expedient for the assessment and collection of an account for all money so collected. Okay, what that means is they have to be on top of their uh, job to make sure that as much as possible revenue is maximized, collection of revenue is maximized. So much is collected by the government. Making recommendation where appropriate to the Joint Tax Board on tax policy, tax reforms, tax legislation, tax treaties, and exemptions as may be required from time to time. So they have the responsibility of um, carrying out this. When it comes to tax policy, when it comes to tax reforms and legislation, they make input. They have their input. They make recommendations. So the Joint Tax Board wouldn't take any decision on these issues without making reference to the states. And here the states come into play. Generally controlling the management of the state service on matters of policy subject to provision of the law setting up the state service. Appointing, promoting, transferring, imposing discipline on employees of the state service. Okay? And that's that for the functions of the state's board of internal revenue. For the state, for the technical committee of the state board of Inland internal revenue, just like we had a, techni a technical committee of the FBI arrow, the composition is made up of um, the executive chairman as chairman, all directors and heads of department of the state internal revenue service, the legal advisor to the board, the board secretary. Okay? All right. What are their functions? What are their functions? They consider all matters that require professional and technical expertise and make recommendations to the board. They advise the board on its powers and duties. They also attend to such other matters that may from time to time be referred to it. View questions. Uh, it is very necessary that we look at some questions and um, 
take you through how you are expected to attempt these questions under exam condition. Because it's always a pitfall uh, for students answering questions. It's always pitfall in the, the way students answer questions. So let's take you through this. Um, I have this question here. Assuming um, you are confronted with this question, asking you to write short note on the following in relation to company income tax. How do you approach it? How do you approach them? Notice of assessment, um, notice of objection. Let's take the first one. A, uh, notice of assessment. What is expected of the student? If you were to answer this question, write a short note. What I expect you to do is one, the first thing you should do is try to define um, assessment or notice of assessment. So you should start with definition. Okay, you should start with definition. How what will you define? How will you define notice of assessment? You could say it's a statement of tax payable. Okay, is a mere statement of tax payable. Is a mere statement of tax payable. That uh, could be a definition of um, a notice of asset, as, uh, assessment. It's a mere statement of tax payable. All right, tax payable. Now the next thing I expect is you will not complete this question. And answer this question if you don't tell us or tell the examiner the content of a notice of assessment. What does a notice, a typical assessment, what should it contain? What should a typical assessment contain? Right? Take it through the content of an assessment. An assessment. That should be the next uh, part of the solution content of an assessment and then you list all of them refer to the lecture notes refer to the video you get the list of uh, the content of an assessment there all right so if you list all of them down you will be home and dry for this question now let's look at the next one which is a notice of objection notice of objection to notice of objection what is expected of the student for this question again you should start answering this question by telling us okay what a notice of objection is what a notice of objection is i uh, expect the student to talk about the point that it is raised or it is the taxpayer that raises a notice of objection where he is aggrieved. Where he is aggrieved, where he objects to an assessment raised. All right? Objection to an assessment, all right? Usually refer, uh, result to, usually results, results in the taxpayer, the taxpayer, taxpayer, okay, raising, raising a notice of objection, notice of objection. Or I could put it this other way. It's a notice raised by a taxpayer in writing where he is objecting to an assessment. Most importantly, you also you should also not forget to tell us the conditions. Tell us the conditions for a valid notice of objection. Conditions for valid notice of objection. Conditions for a valid notice of objection. This will give uh, more flesh. To answering this question, it will uh, give you more marks if you are able to put down these two important points: how a notice of objection comes up, and the condition for valid notice of objection. So, with that, you should be okay with this question. Let's look at the next question. Next question: What's the next question asking us? Here we are, number two. What are the requirements to be complied with when an objection is made in disagreement with a notice of assessment? 
So to answer this question, you will have to look at question one. This question is similar to question one in uh, the way we answered question one. How? Remember in question one, I asked you to uh, put down, put down for notice of objection. Put down conditions for a valid notice of objection. You should list them down. Now this question is asking us that if there is an objection to a notice of assessment, what are the requirements? What should you do? What are the requirements that is expected is, uh, to be complied with? And answering that question, what, 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 what are the requirements that should be complied with? Invariably, you are being asked for condition for a valid notice of objection. Condition for a valid notice of objection. So, to answer this question, just simply put down the condition for a valid notice of objection. What are the conditions? One, uh, come down here and put conditions, conditions for a valid notice of objection. And what are these conditions? One, it must be in writing. It must be made in writing. It must be made in writing. Made in writing. Okay. Two, must have been made within 30 days. Must have been made. Two, must have been made within 30 days 30 days i did mention that in the lecture in the course of the lecture 30 days of the receipt of the receipt of the notice of assessment of the notice notice of assessment notice of assessment and what's the third one three points here it must contain the grounds of objection. Must contain the grounds, the grounds of objection. In other words, the reasons of objecting. Grounds of objection. The reason why the taxpayer is saying no to that assessment. The third question, the third question here is asking us to list the use of task clearance certificate. The use of task clearance certificate. Um, I'll refer you to the lecture, the video lecture. I'll uh, take you to that point where you can go through the use of task clearance certificate. Here you are, this here. All these points mentioned will form solution to that question.